All right. Good morning. Um, this is Una Daly here from the Open Education Consortium, the community college uh, branch of Open Education. And um, I'm very pleased to uh, have Kathleen Amolo from the University of Michigan join us this morning for a primer on open license, licenses and intellectual property. And um, I've had the pleasure of going over this presentation with Kathleen several times now, and it's really excellent. Um, and there will be a recording so that you can share this with your colleagues. Uh, just a few housekeeping details. Um, we are using Blackboard Collaborate from the California Community College Systems today, and we want to thank them uh, for supporting open education at community colleges in California and throughout uh, the nation. Um, if you haven't used it before, we want to point out that on the left-hand side of your screen is the chat window. And um, we encourage you to uh, type in questions and comments as we go along in that chat window. And uh, Kathleen and I will answer those as we get an opportunity. Uh, and we'll save, we'll save uh, the more difficult ones or the more complex ones until the end. Um, and there is um, tech support available if you're having some issues. Um, and I'll let you read the number there at the bottom of the screen. All right. At this point, um, I want to invite you to um, introduce yourself in the chat window. Let us know um, where you're, what institution or organization you're with and um, your interest in OER. Uh, once again, I'm Una Daly, the Community College Outreach Director at the Open Education Consortium. And um, I run these webinars on a regular basis, and I'm just thrilled to have Kathleen Amolo, who is the International Program Manager at the Office of Enabling Technologies at the Med Center at the University of Michigan. Uh, Kathleen, you want to tell us a little bit about your day job there um, and what you're up to this week? <laughs> Sure. So I, 2008, back when I was a graduate student, and I've been working with them for this whole time. And one of the things that drew me to them was um, the fact that they were really interested in tying up in education to a lot of their global health efforts. And hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm actually calling you right now from Ethiopia working with one of our partner institutions, which is a medical school that was started just six years ago. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Um, and um, also on the line here today uh, is James glapa Grossclag, the President of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. Um, James, do you want to say hi? James has, James has typed in, um, in the chat window, Kathleen wins the prize for the farthest flung speaker. And um, yes, um, definitely. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen, so much for taking um, some time out of your busy evening in Ethiopia to, um, to help people out with, um, with open licensing um, and how they might apply that in their work. So now you know uh, where Kathleen is from. Um, um, I'm actually located in California, which is on the west coast of the United States. And I'd like to invite uh, those of you out there in our virtual audience to um, tell us where you're from. If you pick up the little star icon in the middle, in the middle of the screen toolbar, and you can, you can choose an icon there and drop it as to where you're located to show us. And I'm going to take the smiley face here and um, to Ethiopia. I hope I did that correctly. <laughs> Oops. Oh my gosh, it moved. <laughs> All right. It looks like we have folks from the East Coast, um, Northeast. Oops, looks like we've got some from Central East, and uh, we've got them up and down the West Coast of the U.S. And thanks everyone else for uh, typing in the chat window. If, uh, if you can't get the, the uh, little icons to work, go ahead and let us know in, in the chat window. So um, primarily we've got a U.S. Uh, and we, oh, we've got some Canadian folks up, up in uh, British Columbia, I think. Um, and we've got uh, 
Kathleen in Africa. So very exciting. All right. Um, I just want to give a brief overview of the Community College Consortium for OER at the Open um, Education Consortium uh, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. So uh, we are a longtime organization now in Open Ed. Uh, the Community College Consortium was started in 2007 and our mission is promoting the adoption of Open Ed educational resources to enhance teaching and learning. Um, our, our overall goals are expanding access to education uh, for all learners and um, we work uh, heavily with faculty um, by providing professional development and um, opportunities to uh, collaborate with us at different conferences and um, educational um, events. And these webinars that we do monthly are part of our professional development series. And our focus is the community college, um, so that's, that's where we uh, focus. Um, but we work, we work with four-year colleges and universities. Our students become your students as they transfer on in their educational journey. Uh, we um, now have over 200 colleges in 17 states and provinces uh, who are part of our community of practice. And uh, we'd love to have you join us as well um, if um, your interest is in open education from either um, a faculty or a student point of view. So getting to today's topic, um, education is about sharing. And uh, many of um, our open education visionaries have uh, stated this, um, and so I'll, I'll repeat uh, one of them, David Wiley, who, uh, who says that faculty share knowledge with their students um, freely, uh, both through their lectures, their uh, notes that they provide for students, and through instructional materials. And students share their understanding with each other, uh, with the teacher, um, et cetera. And faculty um, share with their colleagues, um, I think, in the best of all cases. And so open licensing is one of those um, enabling um, technologies and um, also legal frameworks that makes that possible. And of course, that's the topic for uh, today's talk. And not to, uh, not to take away from Kathleen's, I'm just going to give you very briefly um, open licensing means uh, for an educational resource. It means that it's free to access online, free to print. Um, kind of the four rules of open uh, that we state often are reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, um, which are very powerful. Um, capabilities which are not available with just free resources. So that's why an open license is so much more powerful than just a free resource. And finally, Creative Commons is the primary way that um, educational resources are uh, released under an open license. Um, and this is where an author chooses to license a version that can be shared by others uh, without asking direct permission, but that author retains the full copyright. So that was just a very quick overview and um, at this point um, to get the, all the background information and the details on that, we have Kathleen Omolo once again um, who is um, at Open Michigan and works directly with faculty on a regular basis uh, to, uh, to share their, their resources. So Kathleen, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. So, Una, do you want to go ahead and advance to my second slide? All right. I'm just going past your overview. So, I think <laughs> great. So, um, as I mentioned, I joined the OER activities at Michigan in 2008, back when I was a graduate student. And when I joined, I joined as a volunteer to help a faculty publish his course as an open educational resource. The Open Michigan Initiative started around the same time with two primary goals. One, to sustain a thriving culture of sharing knowledge at the university. 
and two, to provide and develop a comprehensive um, collection that would provide public access to the university's scholarly output. So not just courses, but also journal articles, software, data, and other scholarly activities. And one thing that really attracted me to the field of open education is that it expands one's community of peers, learners, and teachers. Now, let me talk a little bit about this. And for me, with open education, there's a much larger common pool that people can draw from, and also, which is really important, um, one to which they are also empowered to contribute back to by customizing their learning experiences for their own context. So it's not just about the content. It's about the connections to potential collaborators and to different mindsets. Now, I should probably start by admitting that prior to my role at Open Michigan, when I heard people talk about copyright and other types of intellectual property, I tended to zone out. I thought it was not relevant, I didn't think it was interesting, and I thought it was needlessly complex. Um, kind of unintentionally, as a byproduct of my work with Open Michigan, I became a sort of copyright guru and actually copyright nerd where I talk about copyright for fun. And now I appreciate its relevance, its purpose, and I've learned a number of approaches to simplify how to explain it and how to follow it. For our talk today, I want to focus on four things. One, how copyright affects you as both producers and consumers of educational content, and how that differs between the classroom and outside the classroom. Two, explain the purpose of intellectual property and the different types you may encounter. Three, define the characteristics of open content, such as open educational resources. And lastly, explain the motivations and mechanics of open licenses as a method of sharing and attributing content. Now into slide three. I wanted to begin with some interactive exercises and trivia. In the Blackboard Collaborate panel over on the left, uh, near the top above the list of names, you'll see some icons. I believe the one for questions is a checkbox, so you can please correct me if, I'm wrong, if that's wrong. Um, and I have five questions, which are a mixture of yes, no, and multiple choice. Yes, on to slide four. Good. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> all right, so we're, we're all set for our trivia. First question, yes or no? Any presentation slides that a person would use in the classroom, they can also publish as an open educational resource simply by posting them online. All right. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, uh, but you've got we've got uh, four yeses and six noes. All right. Uh, well, in this case, the answer is no, and the reason for that is your classroom is considered a closed audience for enrolled students. So this means you're allowed certain exemptions given the nature of the use, the fact that it's educational purposes, and for a restricted audience. So a lot of times when we create content to teach, um, we take images and content from elsewhere, whether it be textbooks, images we find online, or kind of content that was inherited from a faculty member who taught the course before. But this is copyrighted content that you can use in the classroom, but you cannot publish or share in a public space. You would need to get permission for content that's not created by you before you share it publicly. Next question, slide five. Which of these are qualities of open content? Um, are you going to read that, Kathleen, for people who might not be able to see? Oh. Um, Sure. So, <laughs> sorry, I think everyone could, could read it except for me. Uh, A, free to access. B, publicly available. C, terms of use that allows copies and adaptations. D, both A and B, so both free and public. Or E, A, B, and C, free, public, and with terms of use that allows copies and adaptations. 
All right. Do you want to know what the winner is? <laughs> Kathleen, we have 13, 13 that said E, um, and then we have a handful for um, D and A and C. Okay. Uh, well, this is actually kind of a bit of a trick, trick question because some organizations have different definitions of open. However, the most commonly accepted definition is E, the content that is free, public, and licensed with terms of use that allow copies and allocations. Next question. Which of these is necessary to copyright a work? A, publication or sharing publicly. B, including the copyright symbol, the C with the circle around it. Uh, option C, actually registering with the copyright office. Option B, both including the copyright symbol and officially registering. Or E, none of the above. All right. The uh, the the answer with uh, the most uh, votes is E, uh, and then with D um, following close behind. Well, the correct answer here is E. Copyright is automatic. Uh, you actually don't need to register with the copyright office. You don't necessarily even need to make it public through some form of current digital publication. And you don't need to include the copyright symbol either. Technically, you don't even need to include the author's name. There are several reasons why it's helpful to include these things. Um, so you can actually track how work is being used. But technically, none of these are required in order for something to be copyrighted. Which brings us to a follow-up question. Slide 7. If none of those previous characteristics are required, which of these ones are? A, tangible format. B, uh, demonstrates effort. C, possesses creative expression. D, is unique. Or E, both A and C, so both tangible and creative. All right. Um, this one was a little uh, more divided. We have um, E got the most mm -hmm. votes, uh, D got the next, and then A. A little difference of opinions there. <laughs> well, th this one I think is one of the toughest questions, and it, it was one of the hardest things for me to understand when I started. The answer here is E. So it needs to be both fixed and tangible format and creative. So it needs to be tangible in some way. That means it should be recorded, you know, sculpted, you can touch it, um, written down, you can touch it, or drawn. So copyright does not apply to things that are not somehow tangible. So for example, a conversation or a speech that is spoken um, but is not recorded via audio or video and is not transcribed is not actually copyrighted because there's no tangible record of that speech. Now for creative expression, it means that in order for something to be eligible for copyright, it needs to have some minimum element of creative expression. So it can't be something that is um, very standard or even um, it cannot be something that's a fact. So for example, a mathematical formula or a chemical representation a really basic stick figure, uh, a table of just numbers, or a list arranged in an obvious manner, uh, manner such as by date or by name, 
does not have creative expression and therefore would not be eligible for copyright. Now, I want to talk a little bit about why it's not the other ones. Uniqueness is tricky. Um, something may be unique, not creative. It's also theoretically possible to have two similar works that each have copyright if they were created wholly independent of each other. Effort is also not one of the requirements. Something may involve a lot of effort, but not necessarily be creative. For example, organizing lists of names and contact details alphabetically, such as the white pages in a phone book, is not eligible for copyright, even though it is labor intensive. Now on to slide eight. Copyright is actually a bundle of five rights. So the person who owns the copyright has the exclusive rights to control these five things. One is reproduction or copying. The second one is the ability to control derivative works or adaptations um, such as translations or other um, modifications to the content. That person also owns the right to distribution so that they're allowed to control um, whether or not it's contracted out to a publisher and what channels it goes through. Other rights that they include are the rights to publicly display something, such as to display a work of art in a museum, and the right to publicly perform a work, such as a stage performance of a play or a musical. Now onto slide nine, which is our last trivia question. Another term that you may have heard during copyright discussions is public domain. What do you think this term means? Is it A, publicly available information, B, something that's not under copyright and is therefore no rights reserved, or is it C, both A and B? Huh. Well, um, maybe I'm the only one who had trouble with that one. Um, it looks like um, C1 with uh, 16 votes, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. B came in at 8. So that was another one that uh, was popular. Well, if I had answered this a few years ago, I would have said B. Because um, that, that was the only way that I had heard it for a long time. But it's actually C. So both of these meanings are very common, uh, not only in the U.S., but actually in different countries and different jurisdictions. So uh, when I will talk about public domain and the rest of this presentation, I'll be talking about it in, in the copyright sense with works that are no longer under copyright. And later on, I'll go into the different reasons why something may not be under copyright and why it currently falls in the public domain. Now on to slide 10. So far, all of my questions and discussion have been about copyright, which is just one of four different types of intellectual property. So, as I mentioned, copyright applies to tangible works with some element of creativity. Copyright protects the expression, but not the underlying idea. Trademarks, on the other hand, apply to phrases uh, images or styles associated with a particular brand. Um, they're a symbol of goodwill and are used in business or commerce. And their protection is based on the di distinctiveness of a brand within a particular market or geographic region. Patents are another type of intellectual property which most often are used to refer to inventions. But more generally, they refer to designs, processes, and practices. The trade secrets, the fourth type of intellectual property, is always one that I found a little fascinating. Because for those, they're kind of like patents in the sense that they're, uh, they generally refer to processes or like recipes for products. Um, but the only way to protect those is if they're kept secret. So if, any, if ever um, a trade secret were released, uh, they would actually become public domain. Yeah. The first three types of intellectual property, copyright, trademark, and patents, were all created to encourage people to share and promote knowledge 
in exchange for granting creators exclusive rights to their creations for a limited amount of time. Now on to slide 11. When you create your content, uh, what is your intent and how do you communicate that to your audience? Slide 12. So, as I mentioned, by default, if you don't include anything whatsoever on your content, it's going to be all rights reserved, which will severely limit you. Uh, this means every single time someone wants to use the work, they technically have to go back to the copyright owner to get permission. On to slide 13. So, what open licenses do is they reduce that transaction cost and essentially change the terms of use from all rights reserved to some rights reserved. When using an open license, the author or copyright owner retains the copyright to the original work. It gives other people um, permission to copy and distribute the materials, provided they get credit and attribution, and under several other possible conditions. With open licenses, you are giving permission in advance for some uses while still keeping the option for people to contact you for permission for other uses beyond that. Now on to slide 14. I read a really good article last year that talked about um, this kind of tension and spectrum between um, giving permission for some uses in advance like you can do with open licenses and requiring each permission request to come to you like it does default with all rights reserved. If your goal in creating a certain piece of content is to influence others and to build authority and reputation for your expertise and content, then open licenses can be a very effective way of scaling that. If your primary goal is monetary gain, then all rights reserved may be a better option for you so that you can try as much as possible to track every single use. It's important to note that, that you need a certain level of authority and influence in order to attract paying customers. And this, I believe, is one reason why we see a number of hybrid models where a subset or excerpt of a collection is shared freely under an open license and other parts are shared as always reserved. So on to slide 15. Again, all rights reserved or a circle with one T is the default. But as slide 16 shows you, some rights reserved is a very easy alternative that you can use. And one of those alternatives you can use is Creative Commons, which is two C's with a circle around it instead of the one C. On to slide 17. Open licenses enable others to make marginal improvements or enhancements and to build upon your work. So this includes revisions and remixes. Slide 18, uh, you can also duplicate it and copy it. Slide 19, which is something that I'm really feeling today, uh, it allows you to share something online, offline, kind of semi-connected in print or digital format. And this is something which has been really essential to us as we've been working with our partner universities overseas that struggle with either consistent or affordable internet access. On to slide 20, uh, open licenses also enable translation into other languages or other formats, uh, as well as a number of other transformations. Now on slide 22, some of these transformations can include things like converting something that was designed for sharing on a desktop computer. Um, to slide 23, taking the same content and adapting it to share on mobile phones. Now I'm on slide 24, and I'd actually like to take a pause right now to see if there are any questions up to this point. Well, Kathleen, you've been uh, getting some appreciation for uh, the slides that you're share that are uh, the content that you're sharing um, about. Um, I think particularly uh, James here mentions that I like I appreciate the lack of judgment in this description. Uh, the choice of license depends on your objective, and um, Quill agrees with that. Um, Mary Burgess from 
uh, up in British Columbia at the BC campus uh, has said that uh, she's finding this super helpful. Um, and I'm repeating this because Kathleen uh, doesn't have access to the chat window at the moment. Um, <laughs> so uh, I just to let her know that um, she is being appreciated um, even though she can't see it. Thank you, Nina. And I particularly Are there any questions for me? I let's see. Uh, all right. Quill says this is by far the most down to earth description of intellectual property that I've heard in a long time. <laughs> so I think you're being very clear. We don't have any questions. And I just wanted to repeat one thing which uh, from one of your slides where you said that restricting access to your content reduces your ability to um, build your authority in your field. And I think that's, that is something that mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a really, a, really is an important incentive for people to openly license. Mm -hmm. Do you have any examples um, from the medical school um, about licensing that you'd like to share? Um, well, I have one in particular that, that I'll talk about that's an example of um, a hybrid model where there's default Creative Commons license as well as in parallel another list of uses that people can use. Uh, in terms of other examples, I would say uh, we don't have one license for all of our resources. We let the authors, uh, for, who for the most part are the ones who own copyright, decide which license they want to use. And in general, we prefer licenses that allow people to create um, adaptations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but for us, we really want to encourage people to be able to adapt it to their different contexts. Okay. And when you're talking about that, uh, Kathleen, you mean the University of Michigan and its partners? Correct. Okay. Um, James uh, did have a question. He said, um, how do you define publicly accessible? Mm. Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> well, yeah. one of the definitions that we use for open content is that anything we have that's shared under an open license should not be behind any sort of login. So for us on our page, um, we don't even require free logins. We want to reduce any technical barriers to accessing content, just like we um, reduce legal barriers by using open licenses. So the first way that we do that is we put it on our institutional website, but we also try to promote it as far and wide as possible by working with other search engines like OER Commons, um, by working with Merlo, by working with some of our partner organizations like the Open Education Consortium, um, and also by sharing our content with other partner institutions who want to make it available locally through their local area networks. Great. Um, and uh, Quill says, uh, three cheers for ease of access and lack of logins. <laughs> Good summary. <laughs> yes. Shall we move on to slide 25? Alrighty. So, licenses are essentially contracts that let other people know how they may use a copyrighted work. And with licenses, the copyright holders may keep their rights, um, and remember there are five, but then they license any one or any combination of those rights to other individuals or groups. So they can sign over all of their rights, but they can kind of distribute them um, however they want to different audiences. Now on to slide 26. So Creative Commons are an example of what we call public non-excludable licenses. So this means that things that are openly licensed with Creative Commons apply to the general public anywhere in the world. 
and that they may exist in parallel with other terms of use for the same work. With Creative Commons licenses, there are four possible conditions that you may choose from, and you can mix and match these four to create six different licenses. One feature which is common to all of them is attribution, or the moral right to be named as the author of the work. And the attribution clause is often referred to by simply by or by, or the little person icon. Now on to slide 27. Uh, another option you can choose is non-commercial, which is the currency symbol with a line through it, or often abbreviated as NC. Non-commercial, at its most common interpretation, means that you cannot sell the work for a profit. There's actually a broader range of these interpretations, and if anyone's interested, I'd be glad to point you to some um, studies by Creative Commons. But essentially, the range of in interpretations go from um, Non-commercial means that no money whatsoever can change hands to a, uh, a more progressive interpretation at the other end, which allows people to charge money as long as they're only doing it to recuperate costs and not generating any profits. Now on to slide 28, uh, which is the share-like option. And for me, I think this, is, this was one of the hardest ones to understand when I started. Share life, share life, which is often abbreviated by either SA or the counterclockwise arrow, is what's called a viral clause. It means that any adaptation, so any translation into another language, any remix into a different medium or format, or anything that directly builds upon and is integrated with the original work, has to adopt the same exact license. So if, for example, I had chosen this clause for this presentation. And someone who is bilingual and speaks Spanish wants to translate into Spanish, they would have to license their presentation under the exact same license. And if someone wanted to translate into that into another language, they would have to keep the same license and so on. So slide 29 includes the fourth and last condition you may choose. And you can either choose share alike or you can choose no derivatives. And no derivatives, or ND, abbreviated with an equal sign, um, gives people permission to copyright or distribute the work, but only if they do not alter in any way. So this means no excerpts, no edits, and no adaptations. Of these four licenses, the CC BY, or attribution only, is the most flexible. And it's the one that we use as a default at Open Michigan. A few years ago, Creative Commons had a group called CC Learn that focused on open licenses in education. And one of the things that they developed was a handout which explained why they thought the CC BY license um, should be the default license for OER. And at at the end of my presentation, I'll include some links where you can go and look at that document. Um, Kathleen, we had a couple of questions Why, which I think need that are best sure. answered right now. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So um, I, this question was from Mary Burgess, and I think it was applying to uh, the Share a Life clause. Um, and she asked, does this apply mm -hmm. to the creation of new content, not just translations? Um, Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the short, simple answer is yes. So if you say, for example, um, someone wrote a paper and you wanted to turn it into a book, so you used part of theirs and you took their work and expanded it into something much greater, that, that adaptation of it would still invoke the share alike clause. Okay, so any revision to uh, content that had a share alike uh, clause would need to have that on, would need to have the same license on the revision. Yes, yeah, that's a very good way to put it. Okay, and uh, Quill also typed something in um, to the chat window, um, which I think uh, people found helpful. Maybe I'll just 
that really quickly. Recently someone told me that Creative Commons said that share alike licenses apply only to the part of the new work that uses the original work. This is new to me. I think the concept is that if I modify a picture with an SA license or a share alike license, the new picture has to be share alike. But my overall slides mm -hmm. don't have to be share alike even though I include this picture. Ah. This is one of the things why I like talking about this stuff because I can go from the simple version to the more like complex it depends answer. And that that's a really good example about you know if you if you edit an individual image and you revise the image that is clearly a derivative that invokes the share like clause. Now, if you were looking at my presentation and the images, you may have seen that I had some share alike images. But my presentation itself does not include the share alike clause. And the reason for that is that when you're putting together something like a PowerPoint presentation, um, the images actually become part of a collection that um, creates the presentation. And if you're building a collection, the share alike clause is not necessarily invoked because you're not revising the content necessarily. You're including it as part of a collection. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, um, Kathleen and, and Quill. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Yes. So Slide 30 uh, is an example of a custom license that one of our open textbook authors used. So, uh, why I wanted to show you this example is that by default, he selected a Creative Commons license and he chose the Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial Share Alike license um, as his default, which he included at, um, at the beginning of the book. But he also included a list of license exceptions exemptions as an appendix at the end of the book. So slide 31 um, shows you what some of these exemptions are. So in addition to the general Creative Commons license, he gave instructors to permission to print some or all of the book for their enrolled students and they could do it for either commercial or non-commercial uses as long as they provided attribution. Another additional use he allowed is allowing translations into other languages, um, which could be either for commercial or non-commercial uses. And that could be done as long as the translations were licensed under an attribution share alike license so that those translations would be shared back with the community. And then slide 32 tells you how he concluded his copyright details. So lastly, because he still retained copyright even though he was using these other open licenses. He encouraged people to contact him if they wanted to use some or all of the book for any other use than the ones that he had clearly already stated. Now on to slide 33. Uh, for the little bit amount of time that I have left, I want to talk about ways that you can simply integrate open licenses into your work. And on slide 34, you'll see four basic steps. The first step is to select a Creative Commons license that works best for you. Two, um, to use other openly licensed works in your work. So anything not created by you should also be openly licensed. Uh, third, properly attribute the authors of those other works that you built upon. And four, um, and four is really key. Make sure you share your work at the end so that other people can actually share. Um, have access to it, use it, and adapt it. But slide 35 gives you an example of how you can openly license a work. Just like you don't need to register in order for something to be copyrighted, you don't need to register in order to openly license something. All you need to do is include the license name and link, the year of creation, and the copyright owner. And this license information should actually be included on the file itself so that in case someone downloads it, they still have that information readily available. One thing to point out on this slide, um, you may see that I'm listed as the author, 
but the copyright owner at the very bottom is actually the regents of the University of Michigan. And at my institution, the default is that the institution holds the rights or the copyright to works created by its employees. We have some exceptions at my institution, um, which are faculty works, uh, works authored by librarians, or student works created for academic courses are all owned by those individual authors. And this kind of copyright ownership will vary by institution. So slide 36 shows you examples of how you can do attributions within a page. The main things to remember when you're building on someone else's openly licensed work is to include the author, to include the title, to include the source, um, ideally the name as well as the link, and to include the Creative Commons or other open license information. This can either be done within the page, or slide 37 shows you how it can be done at the end of a presentation in a style similar to EndNote. So I'm on slide 38 now, and uh, what I've tried to do so far is give you a high level overview, but if you're interested in some additional training and practice, slide 39 um, provides a list of resources developed at Michigan over the past few years. So if you're interested in diving a little deeper, I encourage you to look more at our Describe program, um, which is a model we created for a distributed way of creating open educational resources. And it's actually what sparked my interest in OER back in 2008, and one of the things that I spent a lot of time on in terms of facilitating and refining at Open Michigan. So if you go to this link here, the open.umich.edu describe, uh, you'll see a number of our templates for how we train others to review materials for both copyright, product endorsement and trademarks, and other privacy issues before it can be shared publicly. Uh, we also have a course up on the School of, in of Open, uh, a number of guides, and even a paper-based activity that takes about 45 minutes that you can use to train others to simplify the process of walking through how to do copyright clearance and how to attribute openly licensed content. And this process is actually what we've been using for several years to get people new to copyright new to open educational resources, and in some cases just new to digital publishing, uh, up to speed on the basic things that they need to consider before they share something with a massive or a public audience. Slide 49 is an example of one of the tools or templates that we include as part of the Describe training. So this is something we include as the second page of all of our published works and it explains why we chose to keep certain images or other content. And we may choose to keep it because it was clearly Creative Commons license or other, or shared under another open license, such as the new free documentation license, which is the legacy license from Wikipedia. Uh, or we may keep something because it's public domain, and it could be public domain because it, uh, the work is old and had a copyright term that expired. It could be in the public domain because the copyright holder has actually given up all of their rights and dedicated to the public domain. Or um, in the U.S., something may be in the public domain because it was authored by the U.S. federal government. There's also a category at the bottom you can see that we call make your own assessment. And those are resources which are not clearly licensed and we don't have explicit permission, but there are other reasons why we can use them in our work. And it may be because it's ineligible for copyright and that it shows no elements of creative expression. So my example earlier of a standard representation of a chemical formula would be something that's in that category. Uh, occasionally, we may also keep something under fair use um, if it's been established to be standard practice that are, are used to be fair, such as including a thumbnail or a screenshot as an illustration example accompanying text. So finally, uh, the takeaways that I hope you got from my presentation uh, now here on slide 42 are that all rights reserved is the default, and you're allowed certain exceptions to use all rights reserved content in the closed, restricted audience of a classroom. 
But once you share it publicly or with a massive audience, you need permission. And what open licenses do is they allow you <coughs> to use, exchange, and remix educational materials both legally and globally. So the key that I hope you take away is that what you create is relevant to others. So by incorporating openly licensed or public domain content into your work and licensing your work, you can amplify the visibility and impact of your creation, all while keeping your copyright and all while being attributed. So now I'm on to my closing slide, slide 43. And I want to thank you very much for your attention today. Uh, you can see here our email address as well as our website, um, how you can connect on Facebook. And uh, you can also download all of my slides as well as a video I have and my speaker notes for today. So I think we have about eight minutes or so for questions if you want to open it up, Lena. All right. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, so in working with Kathleen uh, this last week, um, she very graciously agreed to do a YouTube video of, of this presentation in case the, our Internet connection and phone lines didn't work from Ethiopia. So uh, that, uh, <laughs> I will put that link in if Kathleen doesn't. Um, I've got it here someplace. Oh, yes, there it is. So uh, once again, you can share this uh, video of this presentation uh, with your uh, colleagues immediately. So thanks so much for being with us today, Kathleen, and sharing all that great information and um, also for providing that video um, immediately. Uh, we, of course, um, always um, archive our webinars as well, and, and they'll be captioned, which is nice. Um, but it takes about a week, so mm -hmm. this is really super. Um, I'm just going to finish up here with slides um, from the Community College Consortium. Um, so, you know, once again, the Community College Consortium provides webinars and workshops on finding and adopting open textbooks, understanding open licenses. Thank you, Kathleen, for helping us with that today. Um, online accessibility, faculty and student surveys, and um, overall access to our community of OER practitioners and experts. Um, and we had over 40 folks of, uh, from our community on today. Uh, please let me know uh, if you would like to join our community, our online community, um, by sending me an email. And I just put my email address in there. And um, stay in the loop with us. Uh, here's a couple of upcoming conferences. Uh, we'll be filling more of these in over the fall, but we have, a, we have one in San Diego, California, coming up in mid-June, which is our California Community College Online Teaching Conference, an excellent conference for those of you who are active in online or would like to get active in online teaching. And we'll be doing several presentations there on how to um, find and adopt OER. Um, also, um, hope to see everyone at the Open Education Conference in November. Uh, once again, we meet monthly on a more informal basis. Uh, our next meeting is next Wednesday, uh, where um, community members come together, ask questions, and present their projects on a very informal basis. And our webinars will restart again in the fall. So we hope to see you um, either over the summer or in the fall. And now um, I have put both Kathleen and my email address here in the whiteboard. And we are open for questions for the next uh, five minutes. While we're waiting for questions to come in, let's see. Oh, we've got one from Kathleen here. Kathleen, uh, this is from Cynthia. If I can get my college to caption your YouTube video, would you give permission to do this? Well, I already gave her permission in advance because it's Creative Commons Attribution License. Great. So that would be wonderful. Uh, and if she captions the YouTube videos, please send them to me so I will upload them to our YouTube channel. Yeah, so Kathleen, we can, we can uh, sorry, um, Cynthia, we can talk about that as well because we will caption the live, the live vid, the, this live portion of the video as well. Um, but Okay, super. Um, and let's see, Amanda says, um, can you describe the difference between app attribution and citation? <laughs> uh, is she by chance a librarian? Yeah, someone who, who corrected us on our, our use of this a few years ago. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, was a librarian. <laughs> uh, 
Well, we have this on our website, and I, I'm actually struggling to connect online right now, so I can't pull up the official version on our website. But if you can go to um, open that edu slash share slash um, view, I believe, uh, you can see our distinction of it. And how how we learned about the difference is that um, citation refers to a very sort of scholarly um, form of acknowledging someone else's work. So it, it would be something like, you know, the ALA or MLA um, formatting for a particular resource like an EndNote or a footnote. And attribution is much more informal. So attribution generally just refers to acknowledging um, who actually created another work. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. We and also had Christina, a librarian from Washington State who piped in and said almost exactly the same thing in our chat window. So thank you for that. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm glad my memory is correct. <laughs> ah, okay. And um, I've been reminded, and, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that the University of Michigan is a sustaining member of the Open Education Consortium, and we're we're very grateful for their support, um, not only this morning, but on an ongoing basis to help us promote open education throughout the world. So please take that back with you, Kathleen, to uh, to your folks. One earlier question I saw, which I think scrolled off the screen now, but um, someone asked if you could just explain one more time the difference between share alike and no derivatives. Mm -hmm. So um, when you are choosing a Creative Commons license and you can combine those four to create um, you can never actually have a combination that includes both share alike and no derivatives. Because what no derivatives does is it tells people they can copy it, um, and they can either copy it for commercial uses or non commercial uses, depending on it, whether or not the NC clause is mixed in there. Um, but all they can do is copy it. They can't actually revise it or make any other modifications to the content. And what share alike does is it allows people to modify the content, but it means any modifications that they make have to keep that same share alike clause within it. So if something starts as an open resource and someone else builds on it, it, it keeps that share alike license in every single app. Thank you for that, Kathleen. Are, are you still there? I, you know, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Kathleen's explanation. Um, I didn't actually realize, I think I, I, I forgot that you can't have ND and SA on the same license. So uh, thank you for that. I think we lost Kathleen. So um, unfortunately, um, we're just at about at the end here. Kathleen says, sorry, call just stopped. Uh, I got that over Skype. So I want to thank uh, Kathleen once again for an amazing presentation today. Um, and um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, I hope you have a wonderful summer and we'll see you early in the fall with our, webinar, with our webinars restarting. Um, if you have any questions that didn't get answered today, um, please do contact Kathleen or me at uh, the email addresses on the screen and we'd be happy to either answer those or direct you to folks who can. So thanks once again. I um, appreciate uh, your time this morning. And I'll turn off the recorder. <laughs>